Welcome back to the Leadership Forum, a space where corporate leaders share insightful takes on the human side of ingenuity. I'm Sakib Vali, Explorer. Say hi to the future. The leader with us today is Erin O'Toole, President and Managing Director, ADIT North America. Erin has dedicated his life serving Canada. It began with 12 years in the Canadian Armed Forces and recently included a decade of service as Member of Parliament minister and leader of the official opposition in Canada. Aaron now leverages his experience in politics, business, and the military as president and managing director of ADIT North America, a globally integrated at risk advisory firm specializing in business intelligence, due diligence, security, and compliance. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you for taking time out from your globally risk-adjusted schedule. Sakab, it's great to see you again. It's good to be with you for this discussion. I like to joke that I seem to have a hard time holding down a job. Uh, I'm a, I'm a former lot of things. I'm a former military officer in the Air Force, former lawyer, former politician, former conservative leader. But in my decade as a lawyer, I almost divided it in half. About half the time was at private law firms, large law firms in Bay Street in Toronto, Sykeman Elliott and, and Heenan Blakey. But another half of it was as in-house corporate counsel for Procter & Gamble, which is where we met. And I found that opportunity fascinating, not just as a lawyer, but as someone to learn the business of, of marketing and sales and learn from the systems and really the corporate memory that Procter & Gamble has. And for me, it was so engaging to work alongside super bright young Canadians, uh, including yourself. We were both a little younger then um, on developing new products, developing claims, building trust with consumers the first moment of truth, the second moment of truth, all this sort of marketing lingo that lawyers would never get to to work on. Um, and I talked about that experience many times uh, in, my, in my public life, including in the House of Commons on several occasions. I used to also joke that for one year, I was the global lawyer for CoverGirl Cosmetics. Now, Sakab, when you look at me, I don't scream CoverGirl uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but what a great brand, what a great group of people uh, out of um, uh, Hunt Valley, Maryland. And we signed a relatively unknown cover girl at the time named Taylor Swift. And Taylor gosh, Swift. she's done pretty That's well it. since then. So <laughs> what what a fun opportunity. And I used to tell that story in, in groups, particularly when I was speaking with uh, groups of professional women and stuff, and they would laugh when I talk about I'm not exactly a cover girl, but what a what a great opportunity for a lawyer. And I took all these experiences into my public life. So uh, I would say I joke I can't hold a job, but I've I've tried to do some public service oriented things in my life. And I've been fortunate that everything I've done, whether it was my time in uniform or my time in the corporate law world or P&G, they helped me build a path of leadership that made me more knowledgeable, more experienced more compassionate in some cases than typical politicians that increasingly today come with very little knowledge other than political battles. So I, uh, I really enjoyed my time and now I'm bringing all these things together with ADIT, ADIT, to, to help companies reduce risk. So it's a leadership journey that continues. And it was during that time when you were the global lawyer in CoverGirl that I used to be the brand manager in CoverGirl for Canada. And that was the time when we had that, that conversations and and, you know, Aaron, I must say the way we would have those conversations were, were, yeah, we might look back and laugh at some of the times where we might have rubbed each other the wrong way. But at the same time, it was with the intent to develop, to build, to make each one of us a bit better. So and thank you for your service all throughout. We used to joke that the lawyers uh, at, at P&G were sometimes called the sales prevention team <laughs> because we wouldn't we wouldn't let the marketing geniuses have two wild and uh, puffed up claims. We had to prove everything we were saying. Um, but there was a healthy to and, to and fro. You want it to be aggressive. You know, P&G uh, was market leader in most categories or striving to be market leader. And P&G hired incredibly smart young uh, people to and then develop them in, in an organic fashion. So I used to, yeah, we used to have those battles over a claim. Is it... Uh, two times the endurance, twice the shine, whatever these sorts of claims were, a lot of a lot of people wouldn't realize that companies like P&G have scientists and labs dedicated to making sure that they can prove these claims and have what's called 
substantiation behind their uh, behind their claims. But I really, really enjoyed that time. And, and CoverGirl, as you know, uh, was a great brand and had a lot of Canadians in in key roles, both in in Toronto and in Hunt Valley. So uh, I, I've stayed in touch with a few and still enjoy it. Absolutely. Aaron, we're going to take a few different turns during this conversation. One of them is um, at Say Hi to the Future, we explore a human condition um, and we we call it heartbeat. So heartbeat for us is the hyphen between spaces and places, right? Heartbeat is what turns spaces into places. It's what turns a house into a home. Given your public service, give us a sense of what that means to you for Canada and how do you propose we bottle it, serve it, communicate it, and most importantly, live it? That's a great question. I, I would often say that the debates we would have in the House of Commons in Ottawa often were so far removed and remote from the real needs at the kitchen tables, as you said, at the heart of our country, which is the families working hard to provide for their kids a better life than they had and, and to build a sense of community. So I would always try and bring that perspective into uh, into what I was doing, whether it was the case of a uh, of a of an immigrant family who had not been able to sponsor children or stepchildren to to come to Canada with them. Why do we rigidly apply rules that don't seem to recognize the human dimension of of a regulation or a rule? One of the last things I worked on soccer before I left about a year ago was uh, long COVID. There was a woman in my riding that because of COVID lockdowns was just a few weeks short of qualifying for the amount of time for Canadian pension plan disability, CPP disability. She developed long COVID, which insurance companies are now only starting to recognize. And the reason she was a few few weeks short of qualifying for, for disability was because the entire economy of the country had shut down and the government put her on the CERB uh, program and not on EI. So here we were applying rules with specific dates and losing touch with the fact that there's people behind these decisions. And so I was trying to advocate for some flexibility for people in this position of having long COVID. We know there's going to be a small but meaningful proportion of people that, that got COVID and have lingering effects. We then have to change some of our policies and, and programs to recognize that we went through a health pandemic. And it's not just about applying the same old rule that's been in place since 1970. It's about compassion and making sure that we can adjust. So I think that's, in, in politics, I often found that the debates of the day would sometimes take on the, the political dimension or the personal dimension of personalities, me versus Trudeau or Pierre versus Trudeau. And often we would forget the people. And really the House of Commons is the will of the people. It's, it's about democracy. So I think that your heartbeat approach is a good one. What transforms our institution of parliament into being a voice for the people of the country? Yeah. You know, you just sparked something for me, um, Aaron, that I don't think I had quite clued in. Would you say spirit of the law is the heartbeat that we should be thinking about versus letter of the law? Is that is that a way to to say that same thing? Well, I think that's a way to describe it. Yes. You know, if you look at all of these programs, essentially, of our social safety net, if you want to call it that, employment insurance, uh, Canadian Pension Plan Disability, these sorts of programs are meant to provide that net, that safety, that sense of community. And if you are being rigid and bureaucratic, uh, not recognizing that the rules need to have adjustments for the human condition and for changing times, yeah, you're, you're losing the whole point mm -hmm. of having these programs. And so I think this is where passionate members of parliament, passionate representatives of the people can really make an impact because the bureaucracy is like a slow moving ship. Uh, unless people on board start to change the direction or, or impact it, the bureaucracy will just continue to roll, continue to roll, continue to roll. This is why we have elections. We should be building for the long term, but we should also be helping people and not applying the rules too rigidly. 
particularly if, if it will have knock-on effects. I'll, I'll use one last example. When I was the Minister of Veterans Affairs, I used to say, if, if we could make sure that a veteran had all their benefits in place before they even left the military, you were then sometimes avoiding knock-on problems down the road. That lack of purpose, that lack of financial support or emotional support could then lead to marital breakdown, could then lead to addiction, could then lead to uh, impacting the children in a family. So getting things right early on actually avoids larger public policy challenges and larger expenditures down the road. And you could apply that in criminal justice. You could apply that in a lot of areas where if you're too rigid, too unwilling to be flexible, you're going to end up actually causing more trouble, more costs than, than you actually think. Another another area, and this was me as a new Canadian at the time when Van City was happening, right? And so I came to Canada in 2004, and 2010 is when we had Van City. But I had not seen Canada come together the way I saw it in Van City, right? I mean, the, the, the entire country was galvanized. It was own the podium. That was the, the, the tagline for it. And, and the whole own the podium was get the maximum number of medals that Canada has ever gotten before. And and we did, right? And we did. So just from thinking about heartbeat for, for Canada, uh, obviously the, the legislative part is there and should we be thinking about more around the people that are behind the laws? That's one part of it. Uh, sports could be another area of it. Are there other examples that you can think of from your time in service that we would say, you know what, those are the things that we would call the heartbeat of Canada, where We would love to get behind them somehow. So all of us as a country, as a nation, galvanize towards something more positive than than the differences we might have. That's a great question. And certainly sport is something that helps bring us together, as do arts, as does culture, as does embracing difference and diversity and, and building a united Canada and and becoming part of Canada, but also having pride and connection with your background and your your own culture and heritage, not being afraid of that. I think that really is what makes Canada special. But I'll focus on one thing, Saka, that I think is, is critical in terms of that heartbeat that is in decline right now, and that is volunteerism. Mm. I used to recognize volunteers in my riding with community service medallions and awards, because I found that it was about 2% of the population that did the volunteering that the 98% got to benefit from, turning the town into the community, to use your parlance from earlier. What are we seeing? We're seeing a decline of membership in Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs and Legions, We're seeing declining attendance in churches and mosques and synagogues, temples, all all these sorts of traditional, what you might call, ways to bring people together. There was a a great book written, gosh, 15 years ago or so now uh, by Dr. Putnam called Bowling Alone. I'm not not sure if you're familiar with it, but the decline of bowling leagues in the U.S. was uh, just another way that Americans, in, in his study, we're having less opportunity to interact. So if you don't get to interact with other people, even if there's not too much difference in terms of cultural or demographic uh, backgrounds, we're becoming more and more isolated. Uh, social media has made that even worse. So right now, if somebody wants to support a cause, you'll see them tweet about it or they'll put something on their Facebook but they're not actually rolling up their sleeves and going down to the food bank or going down to the shelter or going down to the, to the area of their town that's been flooded and they need help with sandbags and these sorts of things. There are still people doing it, but how do we encourage more of that community volunteerism, that sort of embracing the public good? I don't have all the solutions, but I've written a little bit about it. They're, there's been initiatives called Big Society in the in the UK where they tried to rekindle it. There are some veteran organizations and church groups and others that are trying to do more with the group or their congregation or their their comrades, uh, other than just get together for coffee at the Tim Hortons. 
So I really think this is an, an area that we need that heartbeat. We need to turn active citizens from somebody that just displays the Canadian flag during the Olympics into someone that volunteers a bit of time at their Terry Fox run or at the food bank. If we don't do this, we're suddenly just going to be a number of people that just happen to live That's close right. together, That's right. not in communities. So I think that's why I'm going to continue to comment on this. And I think your heartbeat approach is a great way to sort of encourage people to be more active citizens. Love it. Love it, Aaron. I, I completely agree. And, you know, I mean, I've got two daughters. One of them is uh, now in, in her fourth year university in Ottawa. The second one is just about to go into high school. And they took pride in their volunteer hours that they had to put in. Uh, it was done with pride and, and desire, not out of uh, compliance and and having to do it. So I'm I'm with you. I think that, that there's a there's a spirit of volunteerism that we all collectively need to keep um, alive. And and if we can build the right sort of structure and institutions around it, I think that would be amazing. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. I'd love to get your leadership take on ingenuity and more importantly the human side of ingenuity as it relates to you, your organization's success. What's your take? When has it worked well? When has it not? What have you learned along the way? The biggest thing we're facing in the world right now is a realignment that's taking place. You could call it disruption. You could call it the erosion of the rules-based order or the post-World War II uh, Pax Americana, you know, whatever you want to call it. We're seeing disruption, uh, the rise of China with market opportunities, but also repression of minority groups and and erosion of, of liberties. You're seeing war in Ukraine, where there's been uh, disruption and, and war on the, on the European continent for the first time in, in 80 years. So trading routes, all these sorts of things are, are in change. So ingenuity, I think, means that we have to come up with more creative ways to accomplish what was routine just a few years ago, whether it's trade, whether it's uh, commodities, whether it's operations, whether it's just travel. And I think that's what we're trying to work on through our networks around the world is to come up with solutions, build bridges. We, we do something called economic diplomacy where we try and find solutions. So a Canadian mining company that's operating in, in West Africa, the Sahel, that region is being influenced by Russian money, the Wagner Group, these sorts of things. We need to come up with solutions. We need to come up with new ways of doing things. And um, this is sort of the ingenuity that we're trying to show. We're also seeing it here in, in Canada in terms of public policy debate on everything from pensions to climate change to ESG. I think we need much more ingenuity and innovation in our public policy. And again, this is another area where social media is making it hard. Everyone is is becoming polarized into, into almost extreme views on things. Some young people are having anxiousness because climate change is going to eradicate every species in 10 years on one extreme. And then other people denying that there's even changes uh, taking place or that there's global warming at all. So how can we craft smarter policies? How can we engage more people in the discussion? How can we lower risks? This is the type of creativity that um, that I'm trying to bring. It's not the type of ingenuity you think about when you think about technology and innovation in that front. But I think from a policy standpoint, we're now going from a period of 40 years of free trade and opening markets and lowering barriers into an, a more managed trade period and Canada has to has to adapt to that. We have to wake wake up to the realities and find ways where we can not just compete, but we can win using some of our resources, but also some of our ingenuity. For sure. Yeah. And, and I think the post-COVID time, especially uh, with all the nearshoring conversations and a lot of nations around the world are thinking about protectionism and, and you know, how do we make sure that we are self-sufficient and everything? So I completely understand. Any take on on this latest CrowdStrike uh, fiasco that just that brought everything down? And if you are advising, do you advise um, governments? Do you advise companies in terms of how they can be resilient in, in some of these areas? 
Well, CrowdStrike example is a, is a great one where that outage came as a result of smart moves to protect systems. You know, this was about really data and and cyber security and and making sure that there would not be outages or would not be ransomware or or, or other situations. But unfortunately, one of the updates uh, appeared to uh, to cause more problems than what it was trying to prevent. I think I, we work with a lot of companies that are looking at risks from everything from, from cyber right through to trade and, and reputational risks. And as the, the economies become more globalized, certainly going back to our P&G example, Procter & Gamble was founded shortly after the American Civil War and their first uh, foreign expansion was to Canada. And of course, you know, the North American marketplace we can say is exporting, but it's so integrated, it's 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 really not that foreign to, to us. But if you're going to outsource your manufacturing to Bangladesh or to Vietnam or to to other parts of the world, you're then looking at a whole series of, of risks, political, business, even risks to the safety and security of personnel that you gotta be you've got to be aware of. Now many countries, including Canada, is starting to regulate and require companies to disclose in terms of their supply chain having any exposure to forced labor regimes like the Uyghurs in China. And so I think it's it's a matter of there's global opportunities, but more than ever, you have to be eyes wide open to the technology risks like like with cyber attacks and ransom situations, but also supply chain that seems innocuous like clothing or or these sorts of things you have to know where those goods are coming from and are they being produced with a regime that is uh, imprisoning and using slave labor type conditions we saw years ago where the joe fresh brands and others were were caught in that terrible collapse of the factory in bangladesh well, now, Sakib, we have a ombudsperson for responsible enterprise in Canada, the core office, the Canadian ombudsperson for responsible enterprise. She just uh, retired after the first few years of setting up the office, but whomever they were a pro, uh, appoint to replace her, she already had reports on several clothing brands that were caught in supply chain problems, mining companies and others. So while global seems far away, there will be ESG expectation, shareholder expectation, and sometimes government regulation of something that's far from Canada's shore. So again, going back to your point of being uh, bringing ingenuity, bringing innovation, you can't operate the way you did in the 1980s and 90s anymore. And I think to be competitive, you have to continue to innovate, but also to be compliant, you have to continue to innovate. For sure. How about leadership? What do you look for, groom for, and nurture in the people you hire? I like to see people that have demonstrated leadership in their past. Obviously, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, right? And so how have people led in the past? What type of vision they have for their, their role as a leader? I really respect leaders that have kind of a laissez-faire approach that are not micromanagers, but that set ambitious targets and inspire towards achieving those targets, not by, by micromanaging and browbeating, but through you know, setting up a system of, of, of checks and an environment where if there's problems that they're flagged early and that there's an ability to, to raise it. One of the best compliments that someone ever said about me as I was leaving politics is that I built great teams and nobody can ever remember me even raising my voice to a team member. Now, that's a sign of a style, but I like to say it was a sign of respect because if, if you can't respect your team, you shouldn't be a leader. And my experience in terms of leadership was really formulated in my military service where there was lead by example. And I also saw how when you're training in the military context or you're hunting submarines and uh, and helicopters in the dark of night, as I did as a young man, you realize I've been in much more stressful situations than our 
arguing back and forth about the claims of uh, of of a new lipstick or an eyeliner, right? So, so knowing that um, adding pressure, adding anger or emotion is not actually going to always help outcomes, I think is a sign of of maturity in leaders. So I don't think there's any textbook, you know, solution to being a leader. There's a lot of organic elements that people will have, but how they treat their people, how they sort of set objectives and vision and have a system to really inspire to, to meet that I think is, is, you know, my approach to leadership. And I try and hire people that, that have that similar philosophy. I understand. Um, Aaron, you know, the two leaders, one of them you mentioned already, and actually two of them you mentioned already, uh, Tim Penner, Bob McDonald, uh, and the third one I put in there is John Pepper from our from our past life. You know, here were the three things that with each one of these that that I've I managed to get out. Uh, with Tim, there was always a lot of business pressure, but there was never any transactional pressure, right? He always wanted us to aim higher and go bigger, whatever. But at no point in time was I ever afraid in his presence, not even once. You and I have gone into him having to mediate some of our conversations and, and you know, when we would take that risk over to him. And But it was never out of fear. And, and we could speak our minds. We could speak our, our thoughts and, and would all be, it all be fine. Bob McDonald, uh, the amount of empathy he had for every single individual that he would interact with was just unbelievable. And then John Pepper made, I mean, I have met John Pepper once, right? Physically, I've, like I've heard him many a times, but, and and that one time where I shook his hand, it was, I was the only person in the room for him. Even though he was the CEO of the company and I was at that time, probably just a, a low brand manager. Um, but when he was having the conversation, though it was just for a minute, in that one minute, I was the only person in the room as far as that's how he made me feel. Yeah, no, I, I never got the chance to interact with John Pepper, but I've I've said many times how much I respected Tim Penner. Tim was a great leader. What what always amazed me about him was his depth of knowledge on a whole range of subjects. Because if you think, I think, what do we have, 22 billion dollar brands at the time uh, we were working together and he could he could dive fairly deep on an issue without much preparation now he'd been president for for basically a decade by that time but there's nothing better than having a leader that you're working with or reporting to that you know understands the issues and is going to instill trust in whatever decision they make. And as, as you said, there was no transactional pressure and you trusted his judgment because of the knowledge. Bob McDonald, I think we were talking about him off camera. I had the honor of, of working with him bilaterally when the former CEO of PNG and legal counsel from Canada, who really didn't have much interaction other than one lawsuit that I resolved for the company, um, we had bilateral meetings when he was Secretary of Veterans Affairs for President Obama, and I was the Minister of Veterans Affairs for Prime Minister Harper. And what an amazing opportunity for us to collaborate. He was a West Point graduate. I was a Royal Military College graduate. We He had worked in Toronto and had a, for P&G and had a real love. So I had great respect for him, and I used to also appreciate their they they were serving 30 million veterans almost at that time almost canada's population uh he had whereas i had about 800,000 veterans that we were serving um and we had public health and he ran a network of hospitals and i found he had great empathy and we talked a lot about mental health which was a big focus for me as veterans minister expanding programs for for service dogs and for equine therapy and a whole range of new treatment options for people with operational stress injuries. And we were just starting to reduce stigma. There was the Bell Let's Talk, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And, and this was the conversation was, we're now able to talk about mental injuries from service better, but how can we get people the help they need to become productive moms and dads and colleagues again? And, and Bob and I spoke a lot about 
the innovation needed in that space. So I've, I've had the great chance to work with some amazing leaders in my time in the military, in my time in, in corporate life and in politics. Uh, we I came into this with because I have a certain structure in how I ask questions, but you came into this conversation and there might be something on your mind that I never got to. Uh, so I'll give you the last word. Share something with our listeners, with our viewers uh, that you would like to share with them on leadership, on ingenuity or anything else that you might have on your mind. Well, let me compliment you and your team for having this this podcast and this discussion. We actually need more long form, serious discussions on topics like leadership. Right now in particular, there are very few role models for younger people coming out um, that I think are appropriate role models for leadership. Let me speak on this for a second. If you look now, and I saw this in a lot of young people coming into Parliament Hill into staff roles, particularly young men, there was almost an idol idolizing of, of Elon Musk and of tech bros and of crypto bros and, uh, you know, Silicon Valley billionaires. And that that's not leadership. And in many cases, from what I've seen, there's very disjointed, ineffective leadership in a lot of these situations. And there's a real absence of character and of the qualities of, of strong leaders that I think we need in organizations, whether it's in the military, whether it's in consumer goods and beauty, or whether it's in technology. So I think having these conversations, giving personal reflections on leaders that you worked with, that you respected and why you did, and, and coming up with that balance of corporate responsibility, as you said, the heartbeat of making sure that people and 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 outcomes are as much of the discussion as you know sales and margins i think conversations like this we need more of them you know in the age where you're seeing tweets and little sound bites and people swiping and swiping we need actually much more dialogue and much more discussion and much more focusing on effective leadership not just sort of sh short term memification of leadership so kudos to you and your team why I was happy to to appear, not just to see an old friend, but to to have a, a more serious conversation about what what makes a leader. What do we need to do to remain a strong country, to keep an organization strong? So keep keep having the conversations. Thanks, Aaron. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you for your perspective. And it is leaders like yourself um, that we do need such serious conversations with. So thank you again, Aaron, for taking the time and sharing your insights. Our listeners would love to hear more from you. We will tag you and ADIT North America in our show notes. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Thank you.